Welcome to everybody to this panel discussion on the role of materials chemistry in enabling sustainability. This is coming to you as part of the 15th International Conference on Materials Chemistry, MC15. Before I start, I just wanted to thank the Royal Society of Chemistry for organising this fantastic event, as well as my co-chair, Professor Cameron Alexander from the University of Nottingham, and our fantastic organising committee. I'm really delighted to welcome you this afternoon to what promises to be a highly engaged and very topical panel discussion. Tackling the climate emergency is the greatest challenge that we are facing. To get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050, we need a greater emphasis on research and development, and that's really needed so that we can discover, develop and deploy those technologies that will help mitigate climate change. Sustainability is the thread that will weave through the fabric of that journey to net zero. And I am delighted to be joined today by four experts who will discuss with us what the role of materials chemistry will be in enabling that sustainability. So let's meet our panelists in no particular order. Please welcome Dr. Kerry Goodwin, Chief Technologist at the Center for Process Innovation. Dr. Liz Rousel, Director of the Johnson Matthew Technology Center. Professor Tony Ryan, Professor of Physical Chemistry at the University of Sheffield and Founding Director of the Grantham Centre for Sustainable Futures, and Dr Jenny Baker, Senior Technology Transfer Fellow at the specific UK Innovation and Knowledge Centre at Swansea University. Thank you so much uh, to our panel for joining us this afternoon, and we will hear from each panellist um, to describe their area of expertise. But before we do, just a little bit of housekeeping. This will be followed by an open discussion and we're welcoming questions from our audience via the Q&A function in Zoom. So please just pop your question into the box and as time allows, I will bring those questions up and address them to the panel. So please don't be shy. Um, you can ask uh, any questions at all about sustainability materials, chemistry are welcome. So I'll just go around the, the panel and ask you um, to briefly introduce your area of expertise and if you wouldn't mind, could you share with us what sustainability means to you? So Kerry, could you answer first, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Serena, for inviting me to this panel. It's a great opportunity to have a really interesting discussion. So, um, yeah, I'm Kerry Goodwin. I work at Centre for Process Innovation or CPI. Um, I've worked there for 12 years now. I'm currently a chief technologist. I'm focused on energy storage applications and in particular battery materials. So my background is materials chemistry um, and I've worked in a number of different application areas, typically electronics focused, um, but all related to the development um, and optimization of materials, formulations and how those are put down into a uh, coating ultimately to try and optimize the, the final performance of, of a device. Um, so in terms of what sustainability means to me, um, so just to frame it, um, CPI is an RTO. We work um, primarily focusing on the process chemistry industry um, and we help um, develop and scale up products and processes across a number of different markets. Um, everything from consumer goods to aerospace, agrochemicals, and obviously energy storage applications. Um, and as you can imagine, there's very different sustainability challenges across those markets, but there are key themes that emerge. And um, it's ultimately aimed at enabling greener routes and, and focus on, on things like raw material sourcing, production, um, end of use, um, end of life reuse and recycling optimization. So to me, um, as you've already said, sustainability is a really, um, is a big challenge. It's a very interesting challenge and a, a very important challenge. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, that we can absolutely address um, using today's chemistry techniques and, and a number of different angles to, to optimise any product or process. And so a really interesting challenge to be involved in. Thanks, Kerry. Um, same question to you, Liz. Um, what's your area of expertise and what does sustainability mean to you? Thank you. So, uh, yes, I'm the Corporate R&D Director for Johnson Matthews. So I'm a chemist by training and I actually started in um, the area of medicinal chemistry. 
And then quickly coming into Johnson Mathy, I obviously became very uh, flexible in my chemistry and I worked across a huge range of different applications. So I've worked in areas such as um, design of homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts for improved process chemistry in fine chem and pharma. I've worked in uh, biomass uh, processes, trying to convert biomass to valuable chemical uh, fuels. Um, I've looked at the design of construction of materials, so thinking about how we can make more resistant, corrosion resistant alloys, that type of work. So I would say that my expertise is very broad in that respect. I would not class myself as a subject matter expert in any one area, but what I do do is industrial R&D. And our role there is quite often we're looking at metal-based chemistries, but we're trying to think about how we design materials and products for use so that we can also make an impact in the world, whether that's cleaning the air, whether it's improving people's health, uh, reducing waste and consumption. But we're also always thinking about when we think of a product and how to make it, we're thinking about how to use resources very, very carefully, where they come from. And we're also thinking about circularity. So at the end of the product's life, how do you get those valuable resources back? And that's a very important piece. So sustainability to me means, for me personally, that I'm working in an area that I know is making a positive impact in the world that I'm doing more good than harm, and that I am truly trying to work collaboratively to make a difference to the world today and not impact the future uh, for our children and our children's children. So there we are, long answer, but that, that's, that's why it's very important to me. It was a very inspiring answer, so thank you so much. The same question um, to Tony, um, if you could briefly introduce your area of expertise and just share with us what sustainability means to you. So I've been um, a plastics chemist for uh, getting on for 40 years. And, and as you might imagine these days, uh, it, makes, um, it makes people look down their noses at you. But it's, uh, it's been very important to me as the, the role of materials and materials chemistry in sustainability. And, and as I've gone on as a researcher, uh, it's grown with me. So the, the whole... My, my research is about uh, fast-moving consumer goods and plastics. We apply uh, x-ray scattering methods, rheology, those kinds of things. I work a lot with industry. Um, but as in my role as the founding director of the Grantham Centre for Sustainable Futures, um, I've learned to work in a multidisciplinary way and, um, and learn from people in social sciences, in economics uh, and in medicine. And the 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 sustainability really means two things to me. The first thing is we should all strive to reduce global consumption, to consume less, um, in order that we leave enough behind uh, for future generations and share out the Earth's resources so that there's enough for everyone. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tony. And finally, Jenny, what is your area of expertise? And please share with us what sustainability means to you. Right. Well, I don't know. Following Tony, that's a tough one because I, I would echo a lot of uh, what he's just said. So, so my background um, was, I guess, metallurgy, material science, and very much went down the manufacturing metals route uh, through aerospace with the aim of, you know, I always was interested in sustainability, but I guess felt like, oh, if we can make aerospace grade materials more sustainable, more recycled, you know, that will improve things and actually if you don't follow what what Tony's said and look at consumption and policy um, then you can actually cause um, actually a worse impact with a more sustainable product and this has sort of been highlighted I, I guess back in the uh, 1800s with Jevons paradox where um, as the coal burning became more efficient with the steam engine, um, more coal was sold, not less, because we did more with it. And so what I think of sustainability is I think, one, we always need to go back to, you know, seeing how can it, how does our product, we often make, call it a sustainable coating because it increases the lifetime. But if it causes problems at end of life, we need to really question then, 
is it even better? And we need to really focus on how can we design for end of life and cradle back to cradle. Um, so I would say that's the number one thing. And I think the second thing is that we, as um, scientists and engineers, get involved with policy. And that's not necessarily becoming, you know, policy makers or, but, um, and, you know, campaigning to be uh, our next representative. But in order to have that engagement and make sure that, you know, these are all coupled with the aim that we're all wanting to see, which is, as Liz pointed out, the, re the reduced um, consumption and making a spit for future generations. So um, I think, yeah, that's... That's fantastic. Thank you so much to each of you. It's really set the scene for the rest of the discussion for this, this panel meeting. I'm going to move to the open discussion part of this um, this panel now. We'll have some we have some questions that were submitted already by uh, audience members. Can I ask the participants, please, do make use of the Q and A function in Zoom and let us know any questions you may have um, over the next half hour or so. So each question, I'll direct it to each one of you. But if uh, you want to raise your hand via the Zoom function, then I'll be able to come to you if you want to make a contribution. That I think that's probably the easiest way to do things. So the first question I have, Liz, if I could ask you, um, where can materials chemistry make the most or mo most positively influence sustainability, do you think? I, I, you know, when I read that question, it's almost too big a question, isn't it? Because actually, I, as, a, as a material scientist and a chemist, I would be thinking actually across the board, we can influence and support sustainability. And I really truly believe that. So I think if you think about... For instance, uh, the company that I work in, we are known for our expertise in platinum group metal chemistry. We know those materials are extremely rare. We know that they are mined. So uh, the miners will be thinking very carefully about how they mine those materials. We are one of the world's secondary refiners of platinum group metals, the largest. And we take those materials from products and retrieve the precious materials so we can reuse them. So we then think about how the products are going to be used for positive impact. And we have to design the material science to make them active in duty, but also to be able to be returned and refined to come back into use. And I think when you're thinking about product design, material science is critical. If I give you an example of, say, platinum in a fuel cell, we know that if you alloy that platinum correctly and you can control uh, the uh, atomic scale properties of the alloys, you can actually double the activity of the catalyst. If you do that, you need less. It means that you can then have a much more sustainable product. It's more active, it's more cost effective. And you can think about also how you put that platinum down so that when it comes back in, you can think about refining it. And nowadays, of course, with uh, Tony's area of expertise, we're also thinking about how important it is for soft materials to be refined and recycled. So we start to then think about if you have a fuel cell with a platinum and an ionomer, how do you get that back? How do you resign, refine and recycle? So you absolutely know when you make a product, you're going to be able to get the materials back out and reuse them. And I think that's a really critical thing. So for material science, for me, it's everything from the actual active in the products that we're using for uh, cleaning air, or for um, electrification of the transport chain. But it's all about also how we then get all of that material back in. And I think also we think about, uh, Jenny mentioned uh, metallurgy, designing uh, rigs and products that are uh, able to have the properties for in use. So materials of construction, thinking about what properties are needed and how we can make that and use less of these uh, precious materials, but get the effect that we need. So I think it's across the board. I can't really answer it in any more simpler way than that. For me, material science will absolutely be able to uh, deliver a cleaner, a healthier world. And it's material scientists that will need to think very carefully about designing products and how they're used. Could I just follow up just because we have an awful lot of PhD students and postdocs um, attending this panel and just, how important from an industry perspective are these the sort of fundamental studies that go on at universities when you're talking about like bringing bringing catalysts that that take less of these very very expensive metals but but 
but actually performance wise they're they're enhanced I think it's crucial because I think if when I started to study chemistry you know we didn't see the uh, TEMs and the SEMs that you have now you couldn't see the atomic scale you can see it now you can manipulate it you can create shapes that have uh, more activity in a, in a product it's absolutely amazing now what you can do with that knowledge and you really can make a big difference as material scientists by understanding the fundamental science uh, we work a lot with our colleagues in universities. I value that relationship very highly indeed. And we support and work with our colleagues in universities because we want that fundamental science and then we can apply it. If we understand the science at that atomic scale, we can then understand it across scales and into product. And I think that, that I can't really overestimate the importance of that understanding. So uh, I long, I, I, you know, people say, should we be looking at fundamental sciences? Should we be looking at applied science? And for me, it is all the same. We, are, we need that fundamental understanding to be able to apply our science for a sustainable future. Fantastic. I wonder, Jenny, could I bring you in on broadly the same question, what you feel materials chemistry can do to make a very deep impact on sustainability? Um, yeah, I, well, I think it already has. I think we do need to sort of recognise um, that and what impacts have been made. I mean, uh, I've got an anecdote from a, a colleague of mine who works in corrosion, who, when talking to school kids about corrosion, talked about rust and rust, as you see on your car, and realised she was maybe slightly out of date because of the work that materials scientists in in sort of developing coatings for steels to you know make a, a rusty car really be a thing of the past and unless you've had an accident and I think so there's already been a huge amount that's increased the longevity of our products reduced the costs um, of materials um, what I think now that we need to consider is well when we're choosing a coating to you know for the following the same example maybe on coating steel um, Obviously, Swansea and, and my, uh, our group work a lot with Tata Steel and we're working with them towards net zero. So as a steel plant, you know, they're looking to get to zero um, emissions. And I think we do have we do have a path, whether it's fast enough to net zero emissions as as a sort of society. You know, I don't I wouldn't say when it would be achieved, but we have a roadmap for this. What we don't have a roadmap for and where I feel materials science can really um, enable this is a roadmap to sort of um, sustainable materials extraction and I think that should be the next thing and so when we're looking at that coating that will increase the lifetime of that material but it also creates a problem um, when it all goes back in the blast furnace to be recycled and that extra um, coating can then um, make it more difficult to recycle and you don't necessarily recycle the coating all you do is recycle the steel and you've got the waste then that that was in that coating material and one of the problems that we have um, is the fact that these coatings are often incredibly thin that's what material science has engineered into them as Liz has said we use TEMs and SEMs to look at these things on the atomic scale um, so then we need to really get inventive with how are we going to remove and re-separate them out at end of life? Or do we design in something else? Do we, if we looked at these coatings holistically and from the beginning saying you need to be able to recover it, mm -hmm. it could be that the right answer is, oh, we just use mild steel and send that around the loop. I don't think that's the answer. Um, but I think we need to look at these questions. And I think that then means that material scientists should have skills, not just in the chemistry and, and the, you know, we're materials chemistry talking about today. But I think when you look at it as more broadly as a science, we also need understanding of life cycle assessments and how does the full life cycle look at. And it is then a whole nother language that you wouldn't expect everybody to necessarily be an expert in, but we need to be bringing these experts in life cycle analysis into our teams in in order to mm -hmm. sort of contribute to that next step which will be just as powerful I think as the sort of drive to net zero. I think I think we should yeah maybe dive into that question in, in a little bit about LCA because I think the point you raised about you know unintended consequences of, of, of new discoveries and innovations and 
what we don't want to happen is the road to net zero, we get to 80% and then that 20% is impossible. So I think you raise a brilliant point. Maybe I'll, I'll bring it up in, in, in a few questions time. T Tony, I wonder if I could come to you maybe and ask for an example from your own research where materials chemistry has enabled impact in terms of sustainability. You're, you're muted, Tony. The fra phrase of 2021. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, win the, uh, I win the Zoom bingo by being <laughs> muted. So uh, I want to come back to something that Liz said earlier about uh, the relationship between uh, academy and industry. So, mm -hmm. so my career has been characterised by um, doing the fundamental science to understand processes that were developed empirically. Uh, and, and I would characterise that as the theme that's gone through all of my research. Uh, and it started with polyurethanes, and I'll talk about some of that tomorrow. Um, in, uh, in my plenary lecture. Um, but mo most recently, the, the emphasis of the plastics use has, has been really important. So, so my knowledge gleaned over many years of, how, of polymer processing means that we can now process polymers by controlling the flow and crystallization so that you can use less polymer to do the same job. Um, you can understand how polymers mix together um, through the through the basic thermodynamics of, of solution theory to, to predict which two plastics you can blend together and which you can't, um, and how to design compatibilizers to, to use post-consumer waste. I, I had a grant um, called um, <laughs> uh, Redefining Single Use. Uh, so I, I love catchy titles for grants. So in Redefining Single Use, we, we looked at why and how the, the development, the, the, basically the social anthropology of packaging have led to products and packaging co-evolving. Things that I couldn't have imagined existing uh, when I was a PhD student in terms of snack food are only possible because of metallized PET. And, and how, how do we go about reprocessing metallized PET? And, and to just put into the LCA, um, discussion that we're going to I'm sure come on to understanding how resource energy and the energy mix contributes to materials choice which material do you select for a specific application will change going forward as the people who are doing research in energy storage mean that the energy mix is changing so it will actually make sense to use PLA instead of polystyrene now yeah, sorry, in, in about seven years time, yeah. as, the, as, the elect, as the carbon intensity of electricity falls, but at the moment it really does not. So the other thing about sustainability in my research is it puts me in a position of being able to call out greenwash. And I think that's one of the most important things a scientist can do. Yeah, evidence-based. <laughs> Points. Yeah, I think you've made a fantastic point there. And on the LCA, I mean, Kerry, if I could bring you in from, from CPI, you know, we, we've discussed, Jenny introduced this, this idea of sustainability and life cycle assessment, and it's been touched on by our other panelists. Do you think that there is some value in considering, you know, the training that materials chemists and material scientists have, and whether or not we should be introducing LCA into our sort of undergraduate or master's level training programs and how best could we ensure that you know if we, we we enable those conversations and collaborations between materials chemists and experts in LCA? As to to whether um, there should be some kind of training introduced I think the short answer is absolutely yes it is really crucial going forwards you know, giving materials chemists a greater awareness of the, the factors which affect life cycle analysis would be hugely beneficial. Um, so often when you start to, to look at the details of a, of a product, then you can kind of see why choices have been made around starting materials or the, the synthetic process to make it. And you, you, typically these might be driven, driven by cost or performance ultimately in the end. Um, However, I think as we move towards regulations that we'll be looking in more detail at the carbon emissions of, of producing the, these products and, you know, from cradle to grave, as is often talked about, then there, 
there may well be some different choices to make. And, and Tony's talked about the, the energy mix that, that's used to make those products as well, depending on where they are geographically, you know, that can have huge effects as well. Um, so I think the earlier in a development process, these alternative decisions can be made, the better. Um, and hence why educating materials chemists as part of their, their training um, can, can really help ad advance that and it will, will become increasingly important as well. Um, you know, this, this maybe doesn't need to be complete awareness of, of LCA um, mm -hmm. and the process to, to do that, but it could be aimed at some of the key aspects to allow a sort of technology risk assessment, if you like, to say that's a good choice to make now, that's that's not, um, and um, you know that that might give the, the basics of sort of energy use um, understanding and, and capex costs or carbon emissions that might be expected from from a particular process. Tony, you you have your hand raised. I wonder in the point that you're going to make, could you, in your experience of of doing LCA with materials chemistry type uh, challenges. Do you have an example that maybe might make it clearer for our audience that the sort of the power of this technique? Okay, so so f first of all, I think it should absolutely be part of the uh, undergraduate chemistry curriculum. And um, it, even if it's only to make people aware of it and the methodologies and the way it can stop you making mistakes. Um, so that my, my favourite example is... Um, is, is one that causes dinner party arguments. So um, if you have if you it have a bottle of, if you have a bottle of Badwa, my favourite sparkling water, uh, and a bottle of Buxton sparkling water, um, which one has the lowest carbon footprint if you're drinking it in Sheffield? Okay, so I want to say Buxton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know you want to say Buxton, and everyone wants to say Buxton, but it's actually Badwa. And the reason is that the, the biggest contribution to the carbon footprint of a bottle of sparkling water is the electricity used to blow the bottle. And in France, that electricity is 80% nuclear, whereas in the UK, when we did the LCA, um, it was less than 5% non-renewable. Yeah, so 5% non-carbon energy. So that means that the Buxton water is worse than the Badwa water if you're drinking it in Sheffield because of the bottle. And, it, and it's things like that that doing an LCA really uncover the, not only the, the regional differences, uh, but the resource differences. We did hear from one of our uh, invited speakers earlier who was talking about uh, electrocatalysis and CO2 reduction and, and LCA uh, calculations involved in that and how the energy mix may change with emerging technology. So you can imagine how that hopefully that bottle of sparkled water will come down in, in LCA cost. <laughs> in well, and, and in the, you know, as in, in the future, where we, where we get to having a decarbonized energy system, then actually making plastics from biomass, which has taken carbon dioxide out of the air in a year, yeah, will turn plastic into a, a viable carbon sequestration technology. So plastic goes from being this horrible polluter to actually something that could take a gigaton of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And it's only LCA, life cycle analysis, that allows you to see uh, that new future. I'm going to move on to the next uh, question. And maybe we could, if we have time at the end, we can come back to the LCA discussion. But Liz, I wonder, you know, given how, um, you know, we're not in Dublin together, we're not sort of celebrating MC15 in person. I think the online conference is great so far, but you know, given that the situation we're in with COVID-19, are there things that we can learn from COVID-19 responses that we could apply to sustainability challenges? You're muted as well. Sorry, joining Tony in the uh, bingo, Zoom bingo. Um, it's an excellent question. And I think one of the things that really struck me when the um, COVID pandemic uh, happened was the truly kind of altruistic way that people behaved. They immediately started lending their expertise to try and solve these really important questions. And it really, there, so there were a couple of things that struck me. The cross collaboration between different disciplines was really, really sharp. The speed that we worked was really, really uh, 
accelerated and focused. And the one thing that I do think is really worth mentioning is as scientists, our ability to be able to explain what we're doing and why, particularly in the vaccine research, the testing, I think was really, really crucial. And if you get that wrong, you can really, really alienate the population. And it means that they won't follow the practice that we all needed to do in order to keep each other safe. So I think those are the things. So acceleration of innovation, I saw that. I saw people pulling together in, in ways that we had, you know, never perhaps done before, breaking down silos, learning how to speak to each other in different disciplines, and then really bringing people with you by a very clear, explained, well-narrated message, which was explaining quite complex science, uh, but we needed to do that for the, for the general public. And I think that if we can mimic that again, I think innovation could be very, very, um, it could be speeded up, it could be accelerated to, to create that value from the knowledge. It's remarkable, isn't it, that mm. what normally would take 10 years for a vaccine to come out so it took less than two. It's, it's really just, like you say, it speaks volumes about people's willingness to just come together, work together, collaborate and, and come up with yes. a solution to a, a critical problem. And not only scientists, of course, regulators, mm -hmm. Uh, governments it was it was a really truly collaborative piece and I think actually we you know even people in manufacturing were thinking about how to use their assets to make things that they'd never made before to actually help and support uh, the general good cause so I think that you know I'd love to see that happening more often and really and it was the ability to just realize there were no barriers mm -hmm. and, and anything could be done. I wonder if I could turn to sort of a broader sustainability question um, and so, social equity being defined as a pillar of sustainability and that gender equality is one of the UN's sustainable development goals. I'm just wondering from our panellists, how well is our wider profession doing here? Um, my colleague Katie at the RSC has just shared with us um, a beautiful slide that really summarises some of the fantastic work that the RSC is doing in this space. I wonder, Jenny, can I ask you what you think we need to be doing now to ensure that there is sustainability in our career progression and that we have a retention of excellence in materials chemistry? Yeah, I mean, that hard question, this, sorry. It is a very hard question. And I think one of the things to always recognize that things that improve things for one group of people tend to improve things for everybody. Um, and in fact, I was driven very much to, prior to COVID, do online conferencing. Um, one, to reduce um, emissions because we have so many academics just flying around the world. And secondly, to make it more equitable was sort of a byproduct of that. And um, this enabled us, one, to have a lot more researchers uh, from, in, at the time it was an e India-UK collaboration. So we had equal amounts. In fact, probably more people joined from India than they did from the UK, even though um, usually it would be turned, particularly in physical type networking situations. Um, secondly, actually, um, I had a comment that said, oh, this is great. I've Prior to this, I've only been, I've been very limited on what conferences I can go to because I've got caring responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And actually that comment came from a man. So it obviously, you know, I think the key thing is to try and make the environment better for everybody. And I think sometimes a bit of the focus on we're doing this for women so that this can happen or that can happen can sometimes then one belittle the work that this uh, male researcher was was doing and was, you know, he was taking the load in his family and to sort of lead the expectation that women should be doing mm -hmm. the caring side and that side of it. So I think, and again, then something that probably I'm not very involved with, and we're all guilty of following the thing that affects us most is sort of um, supporting um, people with disabilities. And in fact, I've just been flagged that up with, with that being on the slide. But again, I had people who sort of said, well, I can't fly because of a disability um, and or can't travel long distances. It's very difficult or tiring for them. So I think really 
um, we need to try and how can we make things accessible? And I think one thing is to make sure we've got all the voices on the table. Um, you won't believe the conference, the conference I led in January 2020, the number um, of people who are stereotypical of the people that we see at conferences and we're saying, but live is definitely better and this will definitely be second best being online. Well, for the people who don't have the opportunity to be live, one, that's not second best. That's all they've got the opportunity for. And for a lot of people, actually, the the online works. It allows you to ask questions sometimes more openly and with less threat because you don't need to worry if your voice will wobble or something like that. I, I think that... Um, yeah, so I think the key is really to keep doing the work, but really sort of focuses on making a career path that's better for everybody. And I think that will bring and that also stops the divisiveness or some group being left out or another thing. You know, it, it brings everybody along. And with that messaging, I would say. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, equal, bringing equality, diversity and inclusion for everybody just it benefits it benefits our entire career you know all all aspects of it so I, I i absolutely agree with you i wonder do any of the rest of our panelists want to come in on this point about sustainable careers tony so so one of the things that i've learned over the past decade really is um is the wider group you get involved in a research question uh, the better the answer is Mm -hmm. um, and and that that's really been brought home to me with our work around um, around plastics use, uh, because we've we've actually had people from linguistics involved. Um, so we have a, a an English professor from the University of Sheffield who studies linguistics, and we've now got a couple of postdocs um, in in a project called Many Happy Returns, which is about reusable packaging, and. The technical problems are really not problems. Um, you know, we have technical solutions to, to all of the issues, um, but it, it's how that's communicated and, and especially around um, equitable use of resources, how we talk about things is so important. So as, as materials chemists, it really is important for us to do the right kind of research, having thought about its implications, but also to communicate that uh, more broadly and be informed by uh, the opinions um, and evidence of others uh, in what we're doing. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, having sort of diverse teams, if the most successful ones bring that sort of plurality of views and experiences, don't they? That sort of yeah. you have diverse complementary approaches to problems. And I think, yeah, I completely agree with you. May I just also add that one of the things I've really learned, and I completely agree about the diversity required for innovation. For me, it's absolutely critical. But one of the things that I think we can be quite active on is that role modeling piece, because I think if people can't see someone who looks like them or has uh, maybe a similar condition or a caring responsibility, if they can't see them progressing and they can't see them uh, doing well, they don't believe they can do it. So I really wanted to just mention that because I think we underestimate the power of role models. Yeah. And uh, we can be active in making sure that's really inclusive and it's not just one particular group or not. So I think that's, that's you know, in all of our sustainable people thinking, we need to value that uh, diversity, but make it more about inclusion. One of my colleagues, Laura from the RSC, is sharing in the chat box to anyone who's joined us um, some of the grants and financial support that are available through the RSC for people with caring responsibilities or for anyone who requires assistance to travel to meetings and, and, and conferences. So please check, uh, do check out those resources and we'll be covering some of this tomorrow in, in one of our discussion groups. I, I realise we're getting very close to time. And so I, I sort of, this came up in one of the meet the uh, plenary speakers. There's a lot of discussion on career motivation and career development. And I wonder if I could just take the last couple of minutes to ask each of you to summarize just in one minute, what your own personal career motivation is and what is it about materials science and materials chemistry in particular that's driven that motivation? 
So if I could ask you first, Kerry, what's what sort of inspired you? Sure. I mean, um, it actually sort of follows on from what we've just been talking about, really. You know, I personally enjoy working in a multidisciplinary field and and understanding problems from from different angles, whether it be from the view of a, a physicist or an electrochemist or a chemist. You know, um, I think it's really fascinating. And materials chemistry is kind of is perfect for that, given that there's often multiple challenges to solve and optimize, you know, even the simplest of systems. So um, that kind of means that collaborative working is generally the most efficient way to achieve your goal. And that's that's something that I've seen throughout my career and something that I really enjoy doing a, a lot. So, you know, every day is an opportunity to learn something new and also to, to share your knowledge with others. Fantastic. Uh, Liz, could I ask you the same question? What sort of what's your personal career motivation? I think, you know, originally when I first started out in chemistry, I loved making things. OK. And uh, when I, I was working in uh, therapeutics, so uh, I was making things that I knew because people would write in and tell us how they'd been uh, made well by something that we'd made. I can't tell you how lovely that feeling is. So for me, it is about making things, understanding how people will use them and then really making sure that there's a benefit from making that product. And that, that is a really a massively kind of personal um, satisfaction piece for me. And I think if you talk to any of our young scientists, they will say they join our company to make a difference, a positive difference. So that's why it's very important. And material science is at the heart of everything we do. Tony, can I ask you the same question? What's been your personal motivation for your career? Um, <laughs> being, being inquisitive, you know, how, how does stuff work? Yeah. Right. How does how does that work um, from from a molecular perspective? So so that's kind of driven what I've done. But as I've as I've kind of got past the um, who, how how can I make that whizzier? How can I kind of demonstrate how clever I am um, by doing that bit of chemistry? I've really come around to how can we reduce the impact of the things we do? So, for example, now I'm I'm kind of using all the techniques we developed to study colloids and polymers to try and make shampoo and conditioner and hand sanitizer work but leave but use less so that's me and finally jenny can i ask you the same question what's been your personal career motivation yeah well i think um a lot of the that's been said the fact that material science is well, it is material science and engineering is what I studied at university. And I was really attracted to that mix between science and engineering, um, possibly because I didn't feel, you know, with being a, a young woman going into it, I particularly fitted in engineering. So I maybe there was some serendipity that sort of allowed me to do engineering without it being proper engineering and where I might fit in a bit better. Um, but I've really enjoyed, again, the interdisciplinary uh, side to it. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, and probably that I kept coming back to it. You know, I've moved into the manufacturing side and then, um, you know, really got an opportunity or, or a midlife crisis, as it were, to then move back from industry into academia and do a PhD. And I think... Um, it's really opened um, a lot of opportunities and, and really are just a very fascinating field um, where I think there is a chance to make a difference. And it's, it's positive to sort of hear that, you know, I think we're, there's a lot of really, you know, nice people doing some awesome science. And I think if that's not a reason to stay in a field, I, I don't know what is. Thank you so much. These answers are so motivating, so positive. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant. The time has flown. It's almost quarter past now. We're just finishing up. So I just wanted to thank you for the panelists for joining us this afternoon. And thank you to all of um, our attendees and participants and all the questions that came through before and during the, the panel discussion. It's clear that materials chemistry has a vital role to play in achieving a sustainable future, a future where our own needs are met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. I think given the year that we're in with COP26 on the horizon, highlighting these opportunities and showcasing what our community can do to deliver on sustainability is hugely important. 
So thank you so much to our panelists today, to Dr. Kerry Goodwin, Dr. Liz Roussel, Professor Tony Ryan, Dr. Jenny Baker, and to my RSC colleagues for organizing this. This marks the end of our formal sessions for today, the first day of MC15. We will have a beer and banter and a coffee and chat networking room. Uh, so please do join us back in the lobby of MC15's online platform. Tomorrow, we're kicking off proceedings at half past 10 with the launch of the Recharge Network for folks working in academia with caring responsibilities. So please join us for a cup of coffee and a chat. And that will be followed at 11 a.m. UK time for a plenary talk from Professor Goki Ada on, um, uh, in the, the uh, future materials uh, session. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a fantastic evening and hopefully see you in the networking rooms. The chemical sciences are at the heart of sustainability solutions. Sustainability, powered by chemistry.